Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger. And today we have a couple topics that are really relevant to the Central Florida area in particular, and we'll get to those in a moment. But our guest that's going to help us discuss these topics is Angeline Scotton, and she's currently the wildlife biologist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, a graduate from University of Tennessee, we were talking. Um, and her position focuses on nuisance wildlife issues in Central and South Florida. And that's a, my mouthful, but Angeline, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're so glad you're here. I, I know people, when we think of coyotes, um, people generally don't think of Central Florida immediately as where you might see or find them or that they're a problem. Um, but they are. So let's educate me and our audience uh, with some basic coyote essentials. Uh, how long do they live, size, diet, just some wonderful facts that we can learn from you. Sure. So uh, coyotes are relatively new in Florida. And I know you said that you didn't think they were here in yeah. Central Florida. I think most Floridians don't know that they're here. They're relatively new. Um, they can get to be about, about average coyotes, 28 pounds. Um, so they're about the size of a mid-sized dog. I think the state record was 39 pounds. They don't tend to get larger than that. Uh, lifespan's about six years in the wild. Can go a little longer, though. The average is about six years. And we say they're relatively new to Central Florida. What got them here recently, or why, why are we now finding sure. them we weren't before? So the biggest reason they're here is because we don't have red wolves left in Florida anymore. Red wolves were historically here, and they were extirpated, we're, meaning they're no longer here in the state of Florida. There's still red wolves in other places, but not Florida anymore. And where you have high wolf populations, you have low coyote populations, because the wolves will predate on the coyotes. So the absence of the red wolf allowed coyotes to move from west to east for a natural range expansion. They started showing up in the panhandle in the 1960s and have moved their way south through peninsula or Florida. They've been in the Orange County area for about 30 years now. Um, but even though they've been around for 30 years, still most Floridians haven't seen them right. or not aware of them. Um, and coyotes now are in all 67 counties in Florida. Wow. And, and as far as uh, population, how, how many, let's say in Central Florida, are there statistics that say, how, how about how many? There's no statistics for their population size, whether it's in Central Florida and, uh, or Florida at all. There's no population okay. studies going on that I'm aware of. And um, now we know they've, they've showed up in the 60s. They've made their way down to our area. Um, what type of area? do they you know, most migrate to or you'd find them in? So coyotes like big open habitats. So think fields or meadows or pastures, but in urban areas, golf courses and cemeteries yeah. and uh, baseball fields resemble that. And so we're finding them starting to move into urban areas. Um, and we're also finding that coyotes can do better around people than they can if they were not around people. They can make a better living around people. So they're choosing urban environments, it appears, in Florida than um, suburban, for example. Well, and I'm sure with that urban familiarity um, come some problems. Sure. And I know that we've heard on the news here in Central Florida, you know, uh, coyotes preying on cats and small, you know, small dogs in the neighborhood. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. Sure. So, so for I'll start with cats. Um, when cats are outdoors, they're open to predation by a lot of things, and there's a lot of predators in Florida that will take advantage of that. Bobcats are, are a good example. Coyotes, certainly. Mm. Alligators, maybe even large raptors can take small cats or outdoor cats. Coyotes are particularly good at what they do. They're not targeting cats, more or less, but if the opportunity is there mm -hmm. and the cat's outside and it's unattended, the coyote will, will take advantage of that and they'll go for it. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking to hear from pet owners and, and cat owners that they've lost their cats to coyotes. The best way to prevent predation from coyotes is simply keeping your cat indoors. Right. Um, when they're inside, they don't face predation. Um, they don't face other threats like from cars or from dogs or from um, like getting stuck in sewage tr sewer right. trains. We've heard of that happening wow. for cats. So keeping them inside, it, it helps uh, keep cats from being predated by multiple different wildlife species. Go ahead. For dogs, uh, typically when we hear of dogs being taken by coyotes, it's when they're not on a leash, they're right. not with a person, and they're not in a fenced-in yard. Um, and these are usually small dogs. Um, 
most cases we hear about are around dawn or dusk. Um, there were a, a pet owner might let their little dog out in the yard to do its business and the coyote's there and he takes advantage of that. Um, so for, for small dogs, our recommendation is keeping them on a leash when they're outside or if you have a, a fenced in yard, just being outside with your dog mm -hmm. can deter coyotes. Um, if you think about it, most of us stand between five and six feet tall. It's a risk for a coyote to come up to us when they're averaging 28 pounds. Right. Uh, so they're taking the opportunity when the advantage is there, and that's when people aren't around. And I know we now we've touched on it. My next question, and you've kind of started to answer it, but um, should we be concerned? You know, are they dangerous to humans? Coyotes typically are not a threat to people. They're typically shy and wary of people, um, and and statistically, coyote bites are very low. Um, the last statistics I read show that about three and a half, and you have to give statistics right. a way there, <laughs> right. about three and a half people every year are bitten by coyotes in the United States and wow. Canada. And most of those people are doing something they shouldn't, like feeding the coyote or getting between the coyote and its food. Um, coyotes are very smart. They know once they're fed by people to associate people with food, kind of like alligators. Okay. There's that, you know, that resounding message of not feeding alligators, and right. we need to push that for coyotes too. Uh, but typically coyotes are not a threat to people at all. One of the things we suggest for coyotes in neighborhoods, not just securing pets, we also suggest securing attractants like pet food, bird seed, mm. garbage. Coyotes will eat almost anything. But we also suggest hazing coyotes and making sure they have a strong fear of people. Um, hazing can be pretty easy. This can be yelling at the coyote or throwing rocks at it, um, using an air horn or a car horn, anything you can do to get its attention and drive it away and let it know that it shouldn't be around people. Now, if, if homeowners and residents do all of those things, the coyote's probably not going to pack his bags and leaves <laughs> because there's other food there for right. him, but he will be more respectful and mindful of people and should not be so much of an issue. Now, I know there are probably people watching, and I'm thinking too, you know, Maybe that dog I saw the other day was a coyote, and we're talking, you know, it's much smaller than I would have guessed. Yes. Um, so what, how can, first of all, you distinguish? Do they have some distinguishing features that you go, oh, okay, that's a coyote, not a dog? The best distinguishing feature I can say is that they, they look similar to a German Shepherd, okay. but they're smaller. The coloration's really similar. They have the erect ears like German Shepherds do, but they're smaller. But for me, it's looking for a collar. If there's no collar on and mm -hmm. he's not around a person, that's a pretty good bet that it's a coyote. Um, they also have a bushy tail, similar to a Siberian Husky, um, but they don't curl it up their back like a dog okay. would. They, they hold it straight out behind them. Okay. Um, I think looking for a collar, though, might be the best case scenario. Um, and coyotes' colors can vary. They're usually look like German Shepherds, but they can even be dark. We've seen coyotes that are completely black in okay. Florida, too. Well, that's interesting. And talk a little bit about the, the family dynamic of a coyote. I mean, do they travel in packs? You know, do they stay with the same, you know, mate? To, those type of things that yeah. you might not know. So w when I talk about coyotes in groups, I try not to use pack, because yeah. pack to me is a negative connotation. Yeah, right, it, it um, is. Coyotes don't run together like, like dogs would or feral dogs do. Coyotes are territorial, so they keep other coyotes out of their territory. Okay. And they mate for life, which is kind of cool. Dogs don't do that, right. but coyotes do. They're monogamous. So typically in one territory, you're going to have the alpha or adult male and female together, and they're pups from the year. And so they're a family group. Um, sometimes they'll hunt alone. Sometimes they'll hunt in pairs. So if you ever see more than one coyote together, that's indicative of an adult with its mate or an adult with its pups of the okay. year that it's teaching how to hunt in the area. And typically when um, a coyote has pups, mm -hmm. uh, how many in, in an instance do they typically have? The average is six in a litter. Wow, okay. They mate in the winter, they have pups in the spring, so it's, it's almost April, so yeah, we right. should have pups right now in Florida. Um, but litter size depends on food. So if there's a lot of food in the area, they're going to have more pups. They can have as many as 12. And if there's not a lot of food, they'll have less. They could have maybe only two or three. Um, food really drives their population. And that's 
I, I kind of wanted to bring it back to food because humans can influence that. Right. Um, coyotes are omnivorous, but we know that they'll eat just about anything. They'll eat garbage, they'll eat pet mm -hmm. food if it's outside, um, they'll eat berries, they'll eat raccoons and rodents and things, but that human-related food source can keep them not only from becoming a conflict in urban areas, but may also keep their population levels down. So we actually have a lot of control over okay. that. Okay, it's very interesting. And if you were to give in our closing moments of this segment, um, you know, a couple pieces of, of advice to those that are watching, if they encounter a coyote, what would those two or three things be? The best thing they can do if they encounter a coyote, if they see one, is to drive it away. Yell at it, throw rocks at it, make yourself look bigger than you really are. Make sure it knows that you're the aggressor and it should yield to you. Um, but another closing thought I, I can leave you with, I think coyotes are very misunderstood. Okay. Um, they're here to stay. They, they're, there's no way to eliminate coyotes, and it's better to learn to live with them than try to get rid of them. And um, if they have any questions or concerns, they can make a quick call to uh, your organization, correct? Right. They can call us. Our regional office for Orange County is actually out of Ocala, and our, yeah. our phone number, I can't think of it off the top It'll of go my up. head. Yeah. <laughs> but it's on the website, and they yeah. can certainly call us and reach out to us. Well, that's very interesting, and very interesting that, you know, there are very few animals in general that mate for life. That's right. That the coyote is one of them. Why do you think that is? It's just how they're programmed. You know, I'm not sure that's why they, it's, why they're like that. You know, dogs are not. Absolutely, um, yeah. and, and a lot of other mammals don't mate for life, but it, it seems to be working out well for the coyote and, um, yeah, I can't answer that. Yeah, no, it, research it's just very unique. It's you know, very interesting. I find that fascinating. Um, and, and also, you know, is there ever a concern that the population, I know we talked about that not really a statistic, but, you know, becoming too populated, uh, or is that something that's not a concern at this point? At this point, it's not a concern. Uh, typically, the ecosystem will balance itself out if there's too many, either by something unfortunate like starvation or disease, and, and that can come into play when mammals' numbers get too high. Think about uh, things like distemper with raccoons or, or rabies. Sometimes that will help level out the population. But there's no indications right now that the coyote population is, is out of check. Well, excellent. Well, I've learned a few things today. Uh, and hopefully you've learned a couple things. And I'm going to ask you not to go away. We'll be right back after this short break. Living in Florida means living alongside bears. Knowing how to react when you encounter a bear is extremely important. If a bear happens to wander into your yard, don't feed the bear, don't approach the bear, and do not run from the bear. Black bears aren't typically aggressive. However, they are powerful animals and they need to be respected. Keeping your yard free of items that attract bears can keep you safe and prevent problems for your neighborhood. Be smart. Be bear aware. This message brought to you by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and we have kept Angeline Scotton. She's a wildlife biologist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission with us. Uh, and we had a great conversation in the first segment. In the second segment of today's show, I want to um, talk about birds of prey. Um, what birds would fall under the classification birds of prey that would concern us here in Central Florida? Sure, so a bird of prey or raptor is, is a large, or well, could be a small bird too, that essentially it's catching its food with its feet. Okay. Um, they're carnivorous, so this could be anything from a screech owl, which is about six inches tall when they're full grown, to a bald eagle. Um, and Florida has a lot of species in between, ospreys, red-shouldered hawks, we have peregrine falcons that migrate to Florida. So there's many, many raptor species that are in Florida, which is pretty unique. And, and um, do we find their populations uh, staying the same, growing, I mean, over the last, you know, decade or so? Well, that's going to depend on your species. So we know bald eagles, for example, are doing much better than they have in the last 20 years or so, to the point where they're not on the endangered species list anymore. Um, ospreys have also done, bounced back tri quite tremendously. The only species I can think of that may not be doing so well is the southeastern American kestrel, which is a falcon species, and they're pretty small, or they're about okay. that big, pretty cute. <laughs> yeah, I, and I have seen some bald eagles, and um, a hawk of some kind, <laughs> you know, where I live, quite tall. But, um, so you're saying anything that grabs 
a food source with its with its feet, feet is considered a raptor or a, a bird of prey. Right. So they'll have strong talons. They'll have a hooked curved bill. Um, they could eat anything from fish to rodents to insects, screech owls and kestrels maybe will rely a little bit more on insects, but ospreys and eagles rely on fish, while your hawk species are relying on birds or snakes um, mm -hmm. or, or rodents. So there's, there's quite a, a gap of what they'll eat in between, but very strong feet and a curved bill um, that they use to tear their food. And um, I know we talked about the bald eagles and that, you know, the comeback that they've made is pretty amazing. People would be surprised to know that we have quite a few bald eagles in the central Florida area. To my knowledge, Florida has the second largest population of bald eagles in the nation, and we're second to Alaska. Wow. If, unless that statistic has changed. Yeah. Um, and that's because of all the water in Florida. Eagles want to be around water because they like to eat fish. Um, and we, Florida has been very successful. We have a lot of nesting pairs of eagles, especially in central Florida, um, which is pretty special. <laughs> yeah, very unique. And again, it's something that you know people watching may not have pondered or, or actually realized. Um, what about something like that's commonly seen? You know, the red-tailed hawk. Mm -hmm. uh, again, can be a fairly large. Uh, what type of area would you typically find them? And I know you mentioned the eagle, somewhere near waters, fish. You know that type of thing. Give us home, if you would, sure. for a couple of these other species we've talked about. Sure. So a red-tailed hawk is going to prefer uh, more of a flatwoods type of habitat, while its its similar counterpart, the red-shouldered hawk, a little smaller, a um, little louder too. Mm -hmm. They like more cypress or uh, more oak type of habitat, whereas ospreys you might find anywhere anywhere around a pond or a lake or a beach too. Um, the the other bird I mentioned a little while ago. Screech owls do really well in urban areas. Okay. Um, kestrels prefer open fields. So these birds use a variety of okay. habitats. Um, well, I th we actually have a pair of ospreys that have a nest just over here. Um, and uh, w we've watched them build the nest. And I believe they have um, babies okay. <laughs> up there. And is this the typical time of the year? You know that they that, you, that they would hatch and have a family. Yes, for most raptors, whether it's an osprey or an eagle or a red-shouldered hawk, this is the time of year that they should have young. Uh, in Florida, they start a little earlier than they do in other parts of the nation, just since we're not so cold so long. Right. Uh, but yes, they should have young right now. That's in the ama spring. <laughs> amazing. Now people are thinking, oh, you know, do I need to be concerned? you know, about a, a bird, and immediately you say bird of prey, and they have a connotation in their mind, it's aggressive, it's going to get you, you know, that type of thing. But what, there are some that, that can be that way. And, and what would cause somebody, a bird or a species that typically will leave people alone, you know, to dive and attack people or animals? Sure. Um, so a defensive raptor is going to be one that's d protecting a nest. Okay. And, Red-shouldered hawks are more notorious for this maybe than other raptor species are, um, and they can be a little sensitive. If, if anything gets within 150 feet of their nest, they might dive bomb it, and this could be anything from a dog to a horse. They're, they are fearless when they're defending their young. Um, and if you think about when, maybe before people were in Florida, this was to protect their nest from predation from things like raccoons or snakes, and this was a good tactic. Mm -hmm. um, but if people unknowingly get too close, they might get by, dive bombed too by the raptors. Um, and I want to point out, not just hawks do, do this, mockingbirds will dive bomb you if okay. you get too close. They're probably not going to hurt you though, like a hawk could, since they have such strong and sharp talons. Hawks could maybe hurt someone if they dive bomb and hit them. Now I know I mentioned our nest, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which it's been fascinating to watch that progress and then to hear the sounds of, you know, uh, babies. but. Um, when it comes to the nests, what is the legal, is it illegal to, to move a nest? It is. Um, all raptor species are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. That's a federal law um, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So not only are the birds protected, their feathers, their eggs, their nests, everything is protected. So while the nest is active, meaning there's eggs or fledglings there, the nest can't be moved at all. Once the birds are finished nesting, a landowner could obtain an inactive removal permit, which is free, and that's something that the state gives out and have that nest removed. So if you're having a problem, let's say with a red-shouldered hawk nesting and dive bombing, our recommendation is after the nest, nesting season is finished, getting a permit to remove that nest and maybe cutting the tree in a way to where they won't want to rebuild there again. 
Most raptors have strong site fidelity and they'll come back to the same place year after year um, and even build onto their nests and make it wow. bigger. Eagles are notorious yes, for that. Yes, <laughs> and, and I have seen that from my back door. Um, what are some steps you know, we could take if we are dealing with a, you know, a more aggressive bird of prey um, and it's you know, becoming an issue for your neighborhood or, or your yard in particular, what are some steps we can take to uh, help deter or prevent that? Well, the, while they're nesting, the best thing to do is to try to avoid the nest if you can. I know in some cases, if they're nesting right, right in your front yard, it can be challenging, but try to avoid the nest. Um, if you have a homeowner's association, maybe putting out some signage or roping off the nest to keep people away from it will help. Um, umbrellas and hard hats work too, especially if it's a really defensive pair who's a little bit more sensitive. Um, We've even talked to folks who have put eyes on the back of hard hats. Um, typically, when you're being dive bombed, they're coming from behind you, and you wow. don't see them until they're on top of you. Um, again, that's a tactic they use yeah. with mammals like raccoons right. and things. Um, the best thing, too, is to keep a lookout for the nest. Usually, the nests are large. Yeah. For red-shouldered hawks, it might be in an oak tree or in a pine slash pine, and the red-shouldered hawks are loud. They call quite a bit, yes. um, so they're, they're e kind of easier to spot in some areas. Once they're done nesting, though, getting that permit and maybe removing the nest and, and again, modifying or cutting the tree in a way to where they may not want to come back next year is a good move, too. Absolutely. And I know we touched on the eagles and, and statistically, at least the you know, latest statistics, unless it's changed, you know, we have the second largest population to Alaska, which is where you assume they all are. I right. Mean, um, but what has made Central Florida, you know, for the bald eagle in particular, such a um, comfortable place to live and have a family and exist? I think that that closeness to water first definitely makes it comfortable for them. Uh, we still have a lot of large trees in the area. Bald eagles tend to choose the second tallest tree. The first one might get hit by lightning, yeah. so they choose the second tallest one. But the other thing we're starting to see from eagles is they're nesting on man-made structures like cell towers. Okay. Um, which might sound good that they have more nesting habitat, but in essence, it's really not a great thing to be on cell towers for eagles. Ospreys will do that too. Um, being 200 feet up in a fledgling trying to learn how to fly can be challenging, especially if he can't fly and he falls down from the tower. Um, there's been multiple rehabbers, especially outside of in the Orlando area, that have rescued bald eagles okay. that have come off of a tower and have been injured or gotten tangled in wiring. Um, so I think maybe on the outside, it looks like cell towers are, are helping their population. There's no statistics on it, but with how many rescues rehabbers have done, it may not be assisting them so right. much. The ultimate thing that helped bald eagles is we're no longer using DDT. Yes. Um, I'm sure you know that was a pesticide that right. caused thin shell syndrome for eagles, and without that, that's really caused their populations to rebound. Um, ospreys, too. And talking about ospreys, our little pair here in family, um, it is somewhat like a, a tower. It's on top of this a sign. So, you know, you can see, you can hear, and we talked about the fledglings, uh, and at what point, so we can keep an eye on ours here, <laughs> do they start trying to fly out of the nest, that type of thing? That's a good question. So for ospreys, I think it's between six and eight weeks that they're going to start using their wings and start trying to fly. And if, if they're in an ideal place like a tree, they'll move to branches outside and they'll start flapping their wings and they may make short flights or fall to the ground. Um, that's okay, that's all normal, um, learning how to fly. Mm -hmm. Birds grow really fast though, that's, that's kind of the cool part. If you've ever um, raised songbirds or raised chickens, you, you know how quickly they, they um, feather out and right. leave and are able to fly, and the same work for birds of prey, They're, they grow really, really very fast. <laughs> um, and I know we mentioned about the coyotes mating for life. What what does bird the birds typically do? Most birds of prey tend to mate for life okay. too. Um, I I know bald eagles do. Yeah. I know red-tailed and red-shouldered hawks tend to. There may be a couple species in there that that do not, but most of them do are, are monogamous and tend mm -hmm. to mate for life. They may separate after nesting season and do their own thing, but when nesting season starts up again, they'll meet back together and and. Um, that's probably where the site fidelity comes into play if, for bald eagles, particularly if they're going to the same tree year after year after right. year, maybe they meet there. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know you mentioned also in passing, you know, about rehabbing some of these uh, birds due to various injuries that they've encountered. Um, 
what is the success rate or what is that process in our closing moments you know to rehab and, and do they typically then are they able to be released back in the wild or once they've been you know with humans is that a no? So that depends on the injury and depends on the bird it's a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and luckily you guys have a great rehab center really close by that's the Audubon Bird of Prey Center in, okay. in Maitland um, I don't have the statistics on how often individuals are released but that's the goal right the goal is to uh, rehab them and and release them back into the wild and and I know the Bird of Prey Center in Maitland does a really good job of that that's um, excellent they're one of the premier facilities in not only in Central Florida but probably the whole state well that's amazing and and in our closing moments um, you know let's say we have a neighborhood still heavy wooded you know which sometimes are rare but some of the older neighborhoods in especially Central Florida you know they have that large enough patch of trees and oak trees and where we might find some of these birds um, and so they may have issues more so than a lot of uh, you know new developments where it's a lot of just buildings what are some tips you know two or three things if you are having a nuisance and aggressive you know bird of prey small dogs you know um, that type of thing so for, for a small dog, my suggestion would just be, again, like coyotes, just be outside with your dog, and that's going to keep a lot of, bird of birds of prey from, from diving it um, and staying away from the nest. But other than nesting season, birds of prey really don't bother anybody. Um, okay. if, if you have chickens, possibly, <laughs> you might predate your chickens, and simply keeping your chickens in a coop and keeping them secure will solve that issue. Um, but outside of nesting season, most of the time, birds of prey don't really bother anybody. They, their um, the rodent control of the neighborhood, and they're they're actually doing really well in neighborhoods for that reason. Is um, it actually a plus in yeah, some it's, cases? Yeah, it's great. It's free pest control, natural. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you've been a wealth of information today, both segments, and I I think you know if nothing else, we've uh, helped to educate uh, that there are some birds we might not think are here, actually here in Central Florida. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and uh, so I hope that you have learned a couple things and you can begin to look in your neighborhood uh, for those nests or maybe you hear them calling as you said the red tail hawk red tailed red shoulders and ospreys call Loud. a lot Loud. i have a couple of those yes <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully uh, you can spot some of these birds that you didn't even know existed uh, in the central florida area and just remember if we just all join together we can spread a little bit of joy in our town we'll see you again real soon This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep joy in our town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.